Hello again, friends. Today we're going to be refinishing this Canon FTB QL with spray paint. In my last video, I showed the repair process for this camera, so go check that out if you so desire. First order of business is deciding what color to go with. Since I'm completely broke, this decision was pretty easy. I'm going to go scavenge from my trusty paint shelf. I'm getting pretty tired of seeing silver and black cameras, so naturally I chose gray and white. Just kidding, I also chose orange. These ratios are what I'm aiming for when I go to paint this, with the orange being used as an accent color to highlight areas of importance on the camera. With that out of the way, I started prepping the parts by pulling the old detail out of the top cover. I would have liked to have used my ultrasonic cleaner for this, but unfortunately, it can barely clean loose dirt, so I had to use some chemical stripper to get this out. The stuff is bad for you in pretty much every way possible, so I would definitely recommend using PPE, like I was definitely doing off camera. Next, I'm scuffing up the surface of the metal parts with a scotch bright pad so our paint adheres better and hopefully giving our paint job a bit of extra longevity. I wanna make sure all these pieces are completely clean before I start painting, so I'm gonna give them a bit of a golden bath, if you will. This is just a concoction of cleaning solution and dish soap. I'm gonna dunk these parts in for five minutes at 50 degrees Celsius. At first I was painting the camera with the top cover attached to the camera body. So I had to mask off the inside so that no paints got on any of the internal components. I also wanna make sure these metal hot shoe contacts stay metal. So I'm going to punch out some masking tape with some leather punches. My bottom plate's gonna act as my test subject, so I'm gonna start by spraying a white base coat over it to try and brighten up the gray. This ultimately was a complete waste of time because it had absolutely no visual effect on how the paint looked in the final outcome. One of the trickier aspects of painting was that I had to control how thin I sprayed the paint because I couldn't put it on too thick or else the small parts wouldn't fit back together properly when I went to reassemble the camera. After about two weeks of rain, I got really impatient and sprayed the first coat on the camera outside in the wind. So I had to strip the paint off and do it again. Now, this turned out to be a mistake because my initial paint job was actually much better than what I ultimately turned out with in the end. Ideally, I would be using an airbrush to do this, but I was genuinely curious to see how good of a result I could get out of rattle cans. In TLDR, it's really not worth the effort unless you're spraying in a completely controlled environment. It's like somewhere indoors, which unfortunately I couldn't do. On my second attempt, I got really lucky and a large ass piece of debris fell into the wet paint in the most noticeable place on the camera. So I made the correct decision to scrape it out while it, the paint was still wet rather than wet sanding it. And now I have this really disgusting looking head dent in the front of the camera. Luckily, it matches the really overwhelming orange peel on the rest of the paint job. So we're going to see if we can fix this fucking ugly ass duckling that we have going on here with some 800 grit sandpaper. I was afraid that I'd burn through the paint in the low spot, and that's exactly what happened. After the second coat of paint, the head dent is still noticeable, but improved. I'm still going to have quite a bit of sanding and polishing to do but I think we can actually work with this. The bottom plate somehow went from looking good to terrible. I don't know what happened exactly, but uh, we might be able to sand that smooth. After a significant amount of wet sanding, we got our egregious deformity to the point where I think clear coat will actually cover it up. On the other hand, the bottom plate we were not so lucky with, and I'm gonna have to repaint it or at least try and polish it out. Things aren't looking great, but all this failed work on the camera body would be nothing without a matching lens. I happen to have two lucky candidates here that would be suitable for the job. First one here is a Canon FL, or no, that's a Canon FDN2 filled with fungus. This one is an FDN that I actually pulled apart and cleaned at one point, but you can see where the lens coating was damaged because of the fungus. I'm choosing to go with the slightly older lens because the focusing scale is actually imprinted into the plastic focusing ring. If I went with the other one, the problem is when I repainted it, the focusing scale would be lost. 
Okay, so the first thing I have to do is jam a screwdriver against the front element of the lens. It's pretty wild, but that is actually how they designed these lenses. There's some other f***ery that Canon did as well that you'll see later. Once you're done damaging your front element, you can pop the front trim plate right off the lens. And then it's just a matter of unscrewing a bunch of shit, And you're in down to the double helicoid. Oh, shit. Uh, don't want to drop that. Yeah, the uh, front element just floats in the lens barrel. This is a six element four group design with two sets of two cemented elements in the middle. But probably the most annoying thing about this lens is this double helicoid design, which has a keyed channel that's super annoying to reassemble unless you get it perfectly lined up. But for now, we're not going to worry about that. That's a problem for tomorrow. We're just going to keep disassembling the lens until we get it stripped down to all its main components. The rear coupler is also really annoying to put back together as well. Basically what I'm saying is that vintage Canon lenses are the most annoying lenses that I've ever worked on, which is bizarre because the camera bodies are some of the most enjoyable to work on. The lens has a bunch of these little parts and pieces that I'm extremely good at dropping into the void that is my basement floor, where they are never found again. So if you're going to attempt working on one of these, just be very careful. Maybe get one of those magnetic mats or something. Uh, although I don't know that it would even help. We have now reached the point where I get to do the fun task of scratching paint out of the front trim piece. It only took me about 15 seconds to decide that this was way too tedious, so I threw it into my ultrasonic cleaner. Now if you remember what I said at the beginning of this video, my ultrasonic cleaner is absolute ass at cleaning most things. And there's this interesting phenomenon I've observed where anytime I just want to clean a part, it completely strips all of the paint off of it. Anytime I actually want to take the paint off of something, it does absolutely nothing at all. The other problem is that the build quality of vintage Canon lenses is kind of dog shit, and so they're mostly made out of plastic and I can't use paint stripper. So I'm gonna do the right thing and just paint over all of the existing paint and hope for the best. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty surprised these parts turned out pretty well. The only problem is that because I had to spray the paint very thin and because there was existing paint on there, all of the impressions for the type and numbers are really thin. So this is gonna be really hard for me to paint in the details without rubbing off the base coat. In case you forgot, we still have a third color to mix. I'm just using some standard acrylic paint because I plan on sealing it in with a clear coat anyway. Once again, I'm pretty surprised at how well this turned out. I think it's pretty damn close to what I chose on screen. Okay, we're ready to paint in the details. Just uh, gotta get my paint here. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, so it ate through the cup that I had it in. Plastic cup and spray paint don't mix. Don't worry, I won't make that mistake again. Um, for a third time, I mean. Okay, now this time I'm actually done drooling on myself for the day. And we can start painting this. Honestly, doing the detailing is pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of painting over the impressions with your paint. And then going over it again after a few minutes with rubbing alcohol to take off the paint. Hopefully leaving behind what's in the actual impression. I'm going white on gray, gray on white, orange on both in areas of importance. Things like the flash sync speed or the lens mount indicator, you get the idea. One thing I will mention is that you have to be careful about going over the paint too many times with rubbing alcohol. I had a few areas that were difficult and I kept having to go over it and redo it and wipe it off and paint over it again. And what ends up starting to happen is the rubbing alcohol will eat through the paint. So especially on the small parts, it was tricky because I really had to get it right either the first or second time I did. Areas like the front of the camera with the main logo are the easiest to do because the impressions are so deep. So when you go over it with the paint, it stays in there and it doesn't come out as easily when you wipe it off. But other places are very shallow. And so you have to be very, very light 
or let it dry for a little longer, but then you have to be a little bit more heavy handed when you go to take the paint off. So it's kind of a balancing act. The other thing that's worth noting is that whatever is in the spray paint, the accelerant or whatever, completely ruins any brush that you put it on. So you could just say goodbye to your paintbrush. I only use just really cheap brushes I had laying around for this reason because I, you just like can't get the paint back out. I don't know what's in there, but I wasn't able to do it. After all our hard work detailing, I sprayed the clear coat and the results were catastrophic to say the least. Every fly in a 10 mile radius was just trying to unalive itself into the wet paint. And the finish just turned out really weird. I don't know what I did wrong. Maybe I didn't spray it on thick enough, but either way, I decided I just was gonna have to try and sand these little fly cadavers out of the paint. And yeah, uh, as you'd expect, because they flew in on my first coat of clear, I had to completely burn through the clear coat in order to get them out. At this point, I just decided to send it with some rubbing compound to see if I could polish all of the impressions out of the paint. But I ended up turning a mess into even more of a mess as I flung polish all over my workbench, everything around my workbench, and all over myself. Even after multiple passes, I still couldn't get it smooth because I never really sanded it completely flush or smooth before I started in with the polish. And as you could probably guess, it still looks like shit. You can even still see where the fly was in the paint because it was sort of a mix of base coat and clear coat and it was partially burned through. Regardless, I decided to keep on moving forward and I wanted to try polishing these rails that kind of go over like the body where the leather would sit because they kind of have a shitty finish to them right now in fact actually everything kind of has a shitty finish right now rather than using the dremel this time i decided to try it by hand and it did come out a lot better i think i was using the wrong type of buffing pad or something because the finish was much nicer this time around i actually forgot to do my favorite job in the last video so i get to do that now it's by far the most fun aspect of working on vintage cameras. I, it is so fun. I just love scraping old light seals. This looks like a job for my old friend. Copious amounts of alcohol. 182 proof. But yeah, perfect. Way too much perfect. I employ a tactic that I like to call douse the shit out of it and jam some paper towel in there to yank out all the old gunk. It usually works. All right, we're just gonna cut some new light seals. This is a pretty straightforward operation. You just cut and measure them. One bad transition later and you're good to go. Don't forget that wide boy that sits along the edge. Can't forget the mirror dampener. Just make sure you rake your tweezers against the focusing screen while you're installing that. Perfectly crooked and ready to go. Finally, after weeks of failed, tedious work, we are ready to assemble. We're gonna start with the shutter release lock, applying a nice amount of lubrication to make sure it operates smoothly once reassembled. This piece can be a little bit tricky to put back together because you have to push this tension bar into the channel and then line up the actual shutter release button to make sure it sits properly in there. Three tiny set screws hold the actual locking collar into place so it needs to be lined up properly before tightening down the screws. I'm a little bit worried about the friction caused by the extra layers of paint, so I'm adding some extra grease in where the shutter button goes. Fortunately, the fitment is good and it is able to slide freely. There's just one last little screw to hold the shutter button in place so it doesn't slide through the collar, and then it's all set. We now have to replace the frame counter window using my least favorite type of adhesive, CA glue, otherwise known as super glue. No matter how hard I try, it always ends up where I don't want it to go, including all over my hands, and it leaves a really gross cloudiness to clear parts. The eyepiece took a little bit of force, but it actually popped back in okay, and even without adhesive, I'm not concerned that it'll fall out. Two screws hold the eyepiece in place, and then we can fish the wires through the top cover for the hot shoe. Next up is a true display of my poor soldering skills as I create some of the worst solder joints ever known to man. I had to scavenge a new strap lug from my parts bin, and I'm wondering how it actually was lost in the first place. The fact that it's missing kind of leads me to believe that somebody thought about or attempted to repair this and then just gave up. 
With the hot shoe reassembled, we can put the top cover back on, making sure to keep the wires out of the way of any moving components, which I did not do the first time I reassembled this. But uh, I ended up reassembling it about five to seven more times. As you can see, I forgot to put the diaphragm shroud back on the camera, so I had to take the top cover off for our first time reassembling. I also forgot to paint the screw that holds this on. I'm now reassembling the advanced lever, making sure to add more lubrication as needed to make sure everything operates smoothly. During the reassembly process, I was trying to be really careful not to have my spanner slip or my screwdriver slip and cause any abrasions or scratches in the new paint. Despite my best efforts, I did end up damaging the paint in several areas due to the sheer amount of times I had to reassemble this thing. The additional thickness of the spray paint did also cause some clearance issues in several areas in which I had to sand the paint down in order to get things to operate properly. But for the most part, I was actually pleasantly surprised at how well everything was able to fit back together despite the additional new layers of paint over the metal pieces. There's supposed to be a little felt washer that sits under this screw on the end of the rewind knob, but unfortunately I threw it away so it doesn't rotate anymore. As I sit here editing this, I now realize that I could have just taken the piece off of the donor camera that I used before. The ISO and shutter speed knob is a little bit finicky to put back together, but luckily it's all keyed so you can't actually get it wrong. Okay, time for some more fun with lenses. First thing I'll do is load up our double helicoid with just the right amount of number 30 helicoid grease. This is a really nice middle ground grease where you don't have too light of a focus drag, but it's also not too heavy. Here's the annoying helicoid key thing that I was talking about earlier. These plastic channels create the click stops for the aperture ring. We need to add some lubrication to this to make sure things slide smoothly. This little mechanism locks the lens for use in and out of program mode, which our camera does not support. This lens uses a little metal puck rather than a ball bearing for the aperture click stops. If you didn't want the click stops, all you'd have to do is take this out and there you go, you have a clickless aperture. In my case, I inadvertently created a clickless aperture because I forgot to put the spring back in underneath that little metal puck. Let's go through my various parts containers to see if we can find ourselves a replacement. I think this is actually the original piece that I just misplaced somehow last time I took this thing apart. This is kind of difficult to get back in place, but the grease acts as a sort of glue while you reassemble. A little bit stiff, but that's not a huge problem. By default, these lenses kind of don't feel great to use. Just a few more components to put back together before this lens is back in working condition. The lens release mechanism is pretty simple. It's just a couple screws with the little plastic cover and then the tension spring, which is probably the trickiest part to get back into place. This tiny tension spring flew across my workbench about five times before I finally got it back in place. Then there's this circular thing, which only goes back in one way. And to be honest, I'm really not sure exactly what it does, other than the fact that it has to do with opening and closing the aperture blades. Our camera is looking a little bit naked, so we need to change that by adding some fresh new leather. This is a full grain English bridal leather. It feels absolutely fantastic in the hand, significantly better than the shitty leatherette that was on the camera before. I created a pattern for this in Adobe Illustrator, which I tried to record, but for whatever reason, the footage is MIA. So unfortunately, you'll have to wait until next project for that. Cutting this all by hand isn't the most ideal way of doing this, but I currently do not have a laser cutter or die cutter. I certainly wish I did because it would open the door for some very cool design possibilities, but hopefully in the near future we'll be able to explore that. In the end, I decided to remove the QL badge because it made my life a whole lot easier and we can always add it back on later. I'm essentially just using leather crafting techniques to trace the pattern onto the leather and then cutting it out with the X-Acto blade. The problem with hand cutting is that you reduce the precision every time you transfer the pattern and so the fitment isn't 100% perfect. If you want a perfect factory finish, you have to use some sort of machine cutting method. I found the most accurate way to get the circles cut out in the right position is to apply some paint onto the piece in the center. From there, I can transfer it onto the back of the leather and then use the paint mark as a center point to cut the circle. 
I'm using a set of wing dividers to measure the diameter of the circle, but you could also use a set of calipers, which would probably be significantly more precise. I have extreme difficulty cutting these circles by hand, and as you can see, they look a little bit deformed. But once again, I have a trick to improve my scuff craftsmanship, and it's called a Dremel. A quick test fit indicates that our sanding methods have proved successful. This is about as thin as you can actually buy leather, so I had to skive the top and bottom of the back piece to get the edges to sit flush. After a quick scuff, I started applying the contact adhesive. This is just water-based contact adhesive, which is probably not recommended for this type of use case, but I find that it actually works pretty well. The main benefit of the water-based adhesive versus a solvent-based adhesive like barge or DAP weldwood is that there aren't any fumes, so I can work with it safely indoors. There are plenty of leather crafters out there that use the solvent-based stuff day in and day out with probably not many ill effects, but it smells completely terrible, so I'd rather just use this. The final application requires a fair bit of precision because you only get one shot at actually putting the pieces together. I like to move pretty slowly from one side to the other and kind of stretch and shape it into place as I go. After a fair bit of fiddling around, I've got it about as close as I can realistically get it. I think I actually cut this back piece a little bit too thin. I should have left some extra on the top and bottom and about a millimeter on either side. The design of this particular camera kind of slopes out in the back, so I used a bone folder in order to press the edges into place. You can see there's some unsightly adhesive residue, which isn't a huge problem because we can peel most of that off later. With the front panels on, we're done with the final application and this is how it looks. Yay, how exciting. We're finally at the stage of the project where we can attach the lens for the first time. It's looking pretty good, and at this point most sane people would stop, but I just can't leave well enough alone, so I'm going to see if I can fix that bad paint finish on the top cover. And I ended up making it worse. Polishing revealed more of the uneven quality of the finish and left it looking pretty dull for whatever reason, but for my last trick, I'm going to see if I can throw a Hail Mary and get this thing looking somewhat good. So I decided to use turtle wax. Works on automotive paint, so I figured it might as well work here too. And uh, actually, for once I was right. Of course it's not perfect, but it really did help the finish quite a bit. The problem is, by solving one problem, I created a new one. I got some of the buffing compound on the leather and nothing I tried was able to pull it out. I was afraid this might happen, so I had somewhat of a backup plan. I'm going to try to apply mink oil to the surfaces of the leather in order to darken it down and try to blend in any of the imperfections. Naturally, this should help protect the surface of the leather from rain, snow, and sweaty hand moisture. After that last detour, we're finally done, and here's how it turned out. Overall, I would consider this project a successful failure. This piece is certainly flawed, but I do think it matched up with my original vision pretty well. I definitely want to try this again with an airbrush and, of course, painting indoors. Being able to control the dust as well as the thickness of the paint would allow for a much more professional result. I have a lot of cool ideas that I'd like to work on in the near future, both camera related and otherwise. So if you enjoyed this video, subscribe for more creative and DIY content. As always, if you liked the video, share it with your friends. If you disliked it, share it with your enemies. Thank you all for watching. Until next time, peace.